Hub Hopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. In this very special episode, we go back to the dawn of human civilization and talk about a discovery that is changing everything we know about humans, how we progressed through civilization from the early days of hunter gathering to building large stone structures and it was in 1994 that a german archaeologist named klaus schmidt was investigating a site in southern turkey and what he found was totally unexpected the world of archaeology has changed and everything we knew about early human civilization has changed from there the site we are talking about is kopekli tepe located in southern turkey and this particular site was first used at the dawn of the neolithic period which in southwest asia marks the appearance of the oldest permanent human settlements anywhere in the world our guest today is responsible for the coordination of the gobekli tepe project he completed his master's degree at the university of cologne in 2005 majoring in prehistoric archaeology following the completion of his phd in 2013 he joined the orient department of the dai as a post doctoral fellow and in 2015 took the position of research coordinator for the long term project at gobekli tepe and in 2019 moved to dai's istanbul department where he is now acting consultant for prehistoric archaeology we now present an extremely interesting conversation with a person that is an inspiration for all of us dr lee clare so lee from everyone here in india and indian genes a big big welcome to you on this platform and first of all we'd really like to thank you for taking time out to do this i know that you are just back from excavation as we speak maybe just an hour ago and it's going to be uh, interesting to talk to you but Once again thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Just the thought when I was going through what you were doing as far as Gobekli Tepe was concerned the first thing that came to mind for me and obviously a lot of our listeners is that's a very very exciting career and a very exciting job. Uh, Indiana Jones comes to mind immediately. <laughs> so for a lot of us listening and who are students uh, currently maybe they are choosing careers I would like you to just give us a little bit of background and what got you going here with archaeology how did this start was it something really early that you already knew you were getting into or something that happened maybe as your uh, career progressed yeah i mean i was always interested in archaeology and history uh, mainly and although i'm now working for the german archaeological institute um based in berlin although i'm uh, now based at the uh, department uh, we have a department also in istanbul um I actually grew up in in the UK so I'm actually British um but I moved when I was in my early 20s to Germany because languages was at that time my big thing I wanted to leave England um find you know discover the world speak lots of languages and uh, of course in French and German at school and um I did actually first of all a um a, a degree a bachelor degree uh, or I started a bachelor degree in in French and German and spent some time in Germany But always at the back of my mind I wanted to do archaeology even as I said as a small child I was always interested in history and and uh, dinosaurs mainly and uh, that was really what got me going and um then uh, as I say I I did my um, I went to Germany for a while as part of my uh, bachelor course in German and uh, realized then that I could actually study archaeology in Germany and combine my passion for the German language and my passion for archaeology at the same time and uh, that's what I did so um I more or less well I didn't finish my BA course uh, in in London but I then sort of swapped and uh, moved to Germany and started archaeology there which was a bit of a, a challenge obviously not speaking the language as perfectly as one would like to when one's studying a, a degree in archaeology in a in a country um a foreign country at the time um and then it went from there i mean um i then did my uh, masters um in in cologne 
I then continued to do my um, PhD um, in archaeology, in prehistoric archaeology in Cologne as well. And I haven't looked back since. And then I've been very, very fortunate in that I've been, um, well, um, I've, I've found work after completing my PhD and uh, went to Berlin to work with Klaus Schmidt, who was the, um, the first excavator uh, archaeologist working at Gebekli Tepe. And um, I joined him. And unfortunately, in about a year after I joined his team, he passed away and I was asked to take over and look after things while they found a new professor. Um, the new professor didn't arrive and they asked me to stay on. And now I have a permanent position at the German Archaeological Institute looking after the excavations at Gebekli Tepe. So it's a long story, a bit of a, you know, um, uh, a life story, in fact. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here now and I'm very, very happy to be here. That's really interesting. The story talks a lot about destiny that we are we are now talking and you are here. But uh, as an archaeologist, compared to most of, oh, I guess, all archaeologists, uh, archaeologic sites around the world, which I tend, I think would be about work has been going on there for maybe 90 or 100 years already. But this seems to be probably the youngest one with about 25 or so That's years cool. of active archaeological survey. So I think for you, that must be very exciting that you've got something new to to actually discover. Yeah, I mean, there's always things to discover on an archaeological site. It doesn't matter how long it's been excavated. Um, obviously, uh, Gobekli Tepe has just been, I mean, compared to other sites um, here in Turkey and elsewhere, you know, sites uh, that have been excavated, as you say, for, for a century or more, in fact, uh, Gobekli Tepe is pretty young, you know, um, as you said, 25 years or so. Gobekli Tepe, compared to other um, big archaeological sites, both in Turkey and, and, uh, and elsewhere, um, is relatively young. It's been uh, excavated now for about 25 years, so it hasn't got a long research history in, in that respect. Um, so, but as I say, at any archaeological site, however long it's been excavated, there are always new things that you can discover. Um, and we are fortunate that uh, Gobekli Tepe has been, what well, you know, we, we know a little bit about it, but I would never say that we knew everything about it. I think that would be totally wrong. And even if we did excavate the whole site, I don't think we'd have all the answers either, because, of course, it's a matter of interpreting what we excavate and what we find. And that's something that we can, you know, we can talk about for a very long time. And I think archaeologists in, in, in future generations will do the same about that site. Um, so um, it's a very interesting site to work at, as you said. It's, a, you know, it's one of the most important sites, Neolithic sites here in, in, in Turkey. Um, it's one of uh, two Neolithic sites on the UNESCO uh, heritage list here in Turkey, of course, you may have, may have heard of Çatal Hüyük, um, that's one, and Göbekli Tepe is the second Neolithic site, UNESCO site here in Turkey. Um, and we are fortunate that excavations can continue or are continuing. And as I say, every every day you have the chance of, of finding something new. Right, and I also, I don't know if this is true, but I did hear an interesting story about Klaus Schmidt prior to uh, excavation actually starting at the site is, was it him or somebody else who went there once and then went back and came in again, uh, mm. assuming that it was not an interesting site? Well, um, actually, the site was at, was discovered in the 1960s, in 1963, by a, an American uh, Turkish uh, team from the University of Istanbul and uh, Chicago University. Um, uh, and uh, they visited the site, as I said, in the 1960s, um, visited it and, and realized that there was, you know, a prehistoric site there because when you do this survey work, uh, what you're looking for on the surface is, of course, uh, any indication of prehistoric uh, settlement. And in this case, um, that was lots of, of chipped stone tools, so lithic, you know, lithic uh, artifacts. And the whole site is strewn with these um, these artifacts, um, you know, lots of, of chipped stone, lots of uh, flint. Um, and that's a telltale sign that that is an archaeological site, a prehistoric site. And uh, the fact also that it's a mound, because these mounds um, aren't natural, they're called tells. And the tells, they're dotted around the landscape here in southeastern Turkey, but also all over Turkey into the Balkans. Um, you know, southeastern Europe, very many places. And these tells are artificial mounds, which actually built up over many generations of people living in one place. Um, so building their houses one on top of the other, um, you know, of course, not actually, you know, 
one on top of the other, but they were actually um, living in a house. The house became abandoned or demolished, and they built on the foundations of that house another house, and that continued. And of course, in the course of time, a mound actually developed, and that's what you can see in the landscape. Those are these artificial mounds, these so-called tells um, or settlement mounds, uh, which are also obviously uh, prehistoric settlements. Um, they can span anything from you know the Neolithic uh, up to the Iron Age and, and later, in fact. Um, so, uh, yes, the site was discovered in the 1960s. It was a mound. They recognized the mound. They saw the telltale uh, flint artifacts on the surface and said, OK, this is an interesting site. But at the time, they decided not to excavate this particular site, but went elsewhere. They excavated uh, actually a site called Chayonu, which is on the Tigris, um, a bit further east um, of here. Um, so not on the Euphrates. And uh, yeah, this was then, uh, I wouldn't say it was forgotten, Gobekli Tepe, it was in the books, it was in the records, but it wasn't until the 1990s that Klaus Schmidt returned um, uh, in 1994 uh, and became aware, or was aware of the site anyway, but visited the site and realised that, you know, the site, Gobekli Tepe had incredible potential, especially considering some of the finds um, from the surface, um, there were indications of large sort of... Uh, worked limestone blocks, which, as we now know, are parts of these T-pillars, these uh, fabulous T-pillars that we find in the in the buildings. And he knew these T-pillars from another site where he'd been excavating just before called Nevalichori. And Nevalichori was a site, a Neolithic site as well, where another you know, T-pillar shaped or T-pillar building was found. And of course, he recognized these T-pillar fragments from Nevalichori at Gobekli Tepe and decided or was allowed then to excavate at Gobekli Tepe, and lo and behold, um, we have what we have today. So it was a very uh, fortunate uh, turn of events. So, yeah, the site began, was, the excavations began in 1995, and uh, in 2018 it was already a, a UNESCO site, so it was a very quick uh, process, as it were. Uh, but that's just an indication of how significant and how important this site actually is for, for archaeologists and for everyone out there. Interestingly, you just mentioned about the artificial mound and uh, I've looked at pictures of, of the particular site. So to the untrained eye, we would never know, oh, I mean, I would never know this is an artificial mound or it, it looks natural. But as yeah. an archaeologist, is there something in a mound where you would say, okay, this looks artificial, just something that I'm trying to understand? Yeah, I mean, you get an eye for it. I mean, I don't know how, I mean... Um, <laughs> When you've seen one, then you start seeing lots more. Um, it's just one of those eureka sort of uh, experiences. Um, I mean, I remember the first time I saw uh, one of these artificial mounds when I was in, in, in Bulgaria. And, um, you know, when you've seen one, you realize, OK, it doesn't actually fit in, into the natural landscape. It must be artificial. Um, and sometimes uh, they can be, um, you know, quite symmetrical they don't have to be though but you do actually realize hang on that isn't a, a real sort of natural um uh, mound or, or what have you it, it's certainly um artificial so you get an eye for it um but it's difficult i think for for the layman to actually realize what you know someone going out there and saying okay let's have a look around um is that a tell perhaps not it is difficult but i think uh when you've been shown one um you do tend to to recognize them uh, later Right. And you mentioned Bulgaria. So was that the one that I think there was something in the news where it was suspected that there was an artificial pyramid uh, that was oh. covered up on this mound? Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, no, no, I was elsewhere in Bulgaria. I was doing uh, other research. Um, I was looking at also Neolithic, but also at some uh, Calcolithic uh, uh, sites there. Um, I was only there for a short while, but uh, no, this this pyramid uh, thing. I think that was I think that was in Serbia or somewhere, and uh, that that was. Okay. Uh, I, I think I'm not sure whether it was a hoax or not, but I, I don't think uh, we take that seriously. Okay, okay. Now I just want to understand also, and probably for all our listeners as to how important this particular site or excavation is and and what the impact on everything we know about human history is. So we can get back to that. Now, my understanding, or I guess our understanding generally, is that civilization would have started around 4000 BC. And when we come to Gobekli Tepe, could you uh, tell us or let us know a little bit about the dating of the site so we can yeah. first start with how old it is? Yeah, I mean, 
uh, of course, why is Gebekli Tepe important is a, is a big question, but it's, it's, it's um, a very good question. And uh, to fit it in with the chronology, because of course uh, that plays a role in the significance of the site. Uh, we are looking uh, at Gebekli Tepe, we are dealing with, we could say that the last hunter gatherers um, that were living in southeastern Turkey. Um, and this period when Gebekli Tepe was being built, when it was being used, when people were living there, was a period in which there was a very important transition taking place. You've heard me mention Neolithic. This was the Neolithic transition. So the transition from sort of mobile hunter gatherer populations to sedentary farmers. And of course, this was, it's also been called the Neolithic revolution. But the revolution bit, that sounds, you know, it's actually sort of a bit based on the, the industrial revolution. But the Neolithic revolution was something that happened not suddenly. It wasn't like one day the hunter gatherers woke up and said, hey, let's become farmers. It wasn't that simple. It was a very long drawn out process. Uh, we archaeologists often speak of the long durée, so the long duration of, of this process. So, um, you know, it happened and one of the, there are very different regions um, on the globe, uh, in the world, where, where this uh, development happened, this neolithization, so this transition from hunter-gathering to farming. It happened independently in Africa, it happened in the Americas, um, it happened in Asia, um, in Africa. So, I mean, it's this is uh, this domestic. When I say neolithization, what I actually mean is the domestication of plants and animals. So it is when people started to keep things like animals, like sheep, like goat, um, cows. Uh, it's also the time that people started to domesticate plants. So instead of actually going out and gathering wild grain, wild wheat, they were actually domesticating it. They were actually keeping it, selecting certain types, certain species, and actually then cultivating um, and, and replanting them. So, um, and of course, over the course of time, when you do this to animals and plants, they actually change, the morphology changes, the shape of the animals. It, we say, generally speaking, animals are thought to become smaller when they become domesticated. So the wild goat is, is larger than the uh, domesticated goat. Um, or even with the, with the seeds, for example, if you're looking at wheat, um, you know, there are differences in the, in the grains. You know, we can look at modern wheat and compare it to wild wheat, and you see differences in the morphology under a microscope, of course. So um, this was a time this was happening. And uh, in fact, the region in which Gebekli Tepe is located down here in, in um, southeastern Turkey, also known as Upper Mesopotamia. So we're looking at sort of southeastern Turkey, northern Syria, northern Iraq. Um, this was one of the sort of core regions of this process, a core, a core region of neolithization. Um, we get sort of other sites also, for example, in the Levant. So, you know, in modern day Israel, Palestine, that sort of area, Jordan, um, Iran as well. Um, but, you know, southeastern Turkey, northern Syria, this is really a very important region because this is where we have some of the earliest evidence worldwide for this transition from hunter gathering to, um, to farming. Now, that said, uh, Gobekli Tepe is, was being used at this time, but at Gobekli Tepe, we do not have any indication of, uh, of domesticated species. So there are no domesticated plants, there are no domesticated animals. Um, but what we do have are these magnificent buildings. These, uh, uh, they've been referred to as temples. I'm not too keen on the word, but they're very important special buildings, monumental buildings surrounded by smaller domestic structures, so houses. So the people are actually already sedentary, which means they are living in one place. Um, they were building these monumental buildings, they were living in houses, but at the same time they were still going out and hunting and gathering and perhaps experimenting with domestication of plants and animals. So it's at this transitional time that the site was, uh, was there and um, that's why it's so, so important because it was surprising at the time um, when it was first excavated, when it was realized that this site was of this age um, during the Neolithic transition of this sort of 12,000 years ago. Um, people said, you know, how could hunter-gatherers, people transitioning from hunter and gather, hunting and gathering and, and farming, how could they actually build such structures? So that was a big surprise when it was first discovered. Um, so. Uh, there are also other reasons why the site is so important, and that, of course, is the iconography. 
So in these special buildings, we have these wonderful big T-pillars, uh, which are human representations. Um, you might have seen some pictures um, of the uh, big T-pillars. Some of them have arms on the side. Some of them are wearing a belt, a loincloth. Um, so they're depictions of, of humans. Um, and these uh, T-pillars are also decorated with different sorts of wild animals with symbols. And what we see here actually is really a glimpse into the belief systems uh, of these hun last hunter-gatherers. We can actually see their narratives, their traditions, their stories. Um, these would have been stories which were told around the, probably around the fires in the evening um, and uh, passed on from generation to generation. They were important, uh, the narratives were important for keeping the group together. They were, they were you know, who these people were. That was their history, um, their ancestry. They were talking about their ancestors probably. So. Um, the fact that we have these monumental buildings and at the same time, the first monumental buildings that are known anywhere, and at the same time, these wonderful um, depictions on them showing these narratives, that makes it very special. And that is why actually the site is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The fact that it's A, it has these first monumental buildings we know of anywhere, you know, 10,000, 11,000 years old. And then these narratives and these stories, first for the first time carved into stone and actually transmitted now to us, Today, even though we can't interpret them, we have a glimpse into their into their thinking, into their mind, into their mindset at the time. So it's a very significant uh, and unique site. All right, very and, and there's just so much I have there. I just want to ask you about, but I just want to check with you about you mentioning the carvings uh, with with the stone pillars and the fact that yes, I think that is a question that all of us have when you move from hunter gathering to uh, carving or erecting these pillars. One is, I assume, they would you would need a lot of people. Second is just looking at that, the definitions and the art. These are experts, and for that level of expert carving, it would again have to have come from hundreds of years back because people would have progressed to that level of expertise. To a lot of us who look at this transition, I just want to hear from you. How did this happen? Okay, um, let's just go back a bit because you mentioned, you know, we need a lot of people to uh, make these buildings. I don't think that was necessarily the case. Um, you know, when we think about it, the settlement itself, and we haven't spoken about chronology yet, uh, so the time span uh, that we're dealing with here at the site, uh, we can do that perhaps briefly now because the site was actually uh, in use uh, for a, a span of at least 1500 years, which is like from today back to the year you know 500 um just after the roman period so it's it's a long long time that the site was in use so all of these buildings um you know they weren't built uh as one project they were gradually constructed um to a plan which is you know we see that but i don't think it would be something like a building project which had a certain time limit as to when it should be done like it is today i think you know we have to avoid misconceptions from our present day our modern day and not project them onto the past but as i say that said they do have a general plan um all of the buildings are all very similar um but i think the time involved for their construction was then you know we can't actually pin it down uh but i don't think that many people would have been necessary to carve pillars um to to carry them you know, these guys were not or these people were not um you know uh primitive in any way you know th these people were just like us these were homo sapiens homo sapiens sapiens modern human beings uh you know and if they'd been born today they would be walking around with a phone uh, and 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 instagram and, and what have you you know there's there's no difference but of course they were born in a different time um they were you know their mindset was different their environment was a bit different uh and for that reason of course you know uh uh we, we, sh we just can't project our modern sort of conceptions onto the past. So probably not a lot of people were required to build these things, these buildings, and the buildings were very long lived. Uh, we do think, in fact, they were used for six, seven hundred years. We have new uh, dates, new radiocarbon dates made on charcoal from the, from the, from the walls of the, of the buildings, um, which have shown us that you know, there are different phases to the buildings. We can recognize that in the architecture and that these different phases, you know, they, they actually show that the whole time span of these buildings being in use. One building could have been used for three, four or five centuries, which is quite surprising or it surprised us at the time. And regarding the craftsmanship, 
if you think, okay, this is stone, but what we don't have preserved at Quebec Tepe is the, the wood. Now they would have used wood. There would have been wood. I mean, today the landscape is quite barren because of the cultural, it's a cultural landscape. There's been a lot of grazing and, and you know, farming and various things and the, the trees have gone. But at the time there would have been a woodland around the site. And these people would have been ex expert carvers, wood carvers. And I think they would have just taken their skills from the wood carving and just transmitted them onto stone. So this is, um, you know, we shouldn't uh, consider these people as savages or as, as, uh, as simple or, or, or you know, um, these were, were very intelligent people with very intelligent, uh, um, you know, complex uh, systems, complex narratives, complex uh, craftsmen uh, or craftswomen. This is, um, you know, We've got to be clear about that. I was just wondering about how the art would have developed or how they would have, because mm. I think you said it was used for this particular site was about 1,500 years. So that makes it a little bit easier for us to understand because when we look at this timeline, it's difficult otherwise that how did this all of a sudden happen? But I think that's yeah. that's pretty well, clear. You know, and the, mm, before before the Neolithic, there was, of course, the, the Paleolithic or the Epipaleolithic, which is like the, the old Stone Age and the end of the old Stone Age. And, uh, you know, People were living in this this region for many thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, in fact, before um, Quebec Tepe. And of course, um, for that long period before, there was always hunter gatherers. And of course, it was at the time of Quebec Tepe that this transition actually occurred. And if it hadn't been for the Neolithic Revolution or the Neolithic transition, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't have, you know, farming. We wouldn't have uh, you know, civilization as we know it today without this step having happened. And I think there would have also uh, considering what we were talking about now, there would have had to be a, some big motivation to carry out a project like this, right? And I think in 2019, you, you did uh, write a paper that spoke about ritual practices and conflict mitigation. Probably if you could let us know something that I found interesting was, did hunter-gathering come first? Or did the need to have a religion or have a religion and then get into ritual practice mm. so the motivation to me i'm just there had to be a deeper motivation to get into yeah. this because I otherwise was, gathering... uh, uh, mm, i think there was a deeper motivation now if we if we consider um you know the fact that uh, this transitional period from from hunter gathering to uh, sort of becoming farmers um this would have been a time when a lot of changes would have been taking place um, people becoming sedentary and of course if you're no longer moving around the landscape and you're staying in one place what usually happens is the population expands because of course you know you have more children the population increases um, and then what happens of course you're using resources so you have a lot of resources in the because you can't move to another area for new resources because you're actually located in one place so you have to allocate resources resources perhaps become scarce um, perhaps there's higher competition for certain things. Perhaps for the first time at this time in, in, in history, we have, you know, a hierarchization actually taking place. So these hunter-gatherers, which were more or less sort of in, a, in an egalitarian sort of society beforehand, were now for the first time coming, uh, were being confronted by sort of people becoming, you know, more influential or richer, having more resources or more access to resources. And this is something, you know, for the, for an egalitarian society coming face to face with this for the first time, this is causing you some stress. Yeah, this is causing perhaps conflict. Uh, people, you know, are, are fighting. There's always a reason for fighting. We, we you know, look at history, but I think the Neolithic and the period when we have this first hierarchization of society, the haves and the have-nots, then you're going to get an increase in in the risk for of, of, of conflict. Um, and I think they had to find a way of coping with this transition and coping with all of these new challenges. And I think for me, these special buildings, these so-called temples, were places not just for ancestral or veneration or, or worship or, or rituals, but there were places where people came together. There were people, there, there were places where the, the common identity of these people was actually expressed in these narratives that you see on the pillars. And actually, it's very interesting if you look at the shape of the buildings, they're, they're usually oval or round in shape, uh, six, seven, eight meters across in diameter. And you have two central T pillars in the middle, so two big uh, you know, humans or big people in the middle. And around uh, the outside of the or so in the walls, you have lots of smaller T pillars at regular intervals. So it's very much like a meeting. So you have all of these people sitting down, looking in, 
in a circle with two important figures in the middle talking, communicating, the narratives are being communicated, the storytelling is still taking place. And I think this was a mechanism for mitigating uh, these these new challenges for dealing with the conflict that was taking place to you know say hey we are one community you know we will trans yeah you know, of course they didn't actually know they were going for this transition at the time probably um, but uh, this was a way for them to mitigate a lot of their problems and to, to solve a lot of their problems and to, to communicate I think communication is a big part of these buildings it's not just about ritual and worship and ancestors and and uh, when we have uh, you know statues and various things coming out and, and um, the animal depictions and, and various things but I think it was more about communication and identity and actually coming to terms and coping with this sort of transition that was taking place uh, uh, in the region at the time. Sure and I also found something very interesting when I was researching about this and this is a paper that I think you co-authored where you all spoke about the modified human crania from Gobekli Tepe uh -huh. that provided some yeah. evidence for a skull cult and that something like this immediately gets the attention of everyone if you know what I mean. Of course, <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, more now, more, than, you know, more than any of the others, this, this one know, stands yeah. out. So, yeah, but the thing is, of course, uh, this skull cult is not just something that we have at Quebec you know, a skull, The skull cult is something quite unique uh, or quite you know, characteristic of the Neolithic, uh, the early Neolithic in, 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 this, in this region um, and the Levant. So what happened is, uh, of course, the ancestors played a very important role. I'm not talking about gods now because, as I say, I think uh, this is sort of a pre-god sort of thing. I don't think, you know, I, I think people were practicing ancestor veneration at Gobekli Tepe, animism, ancestor veneration, but the ancestors were a very important uh, uh, thing. And uh, for various reasons, the ancestors uh, had the knowledge, the ancestors um, were, were the four, you know, they went before and they had this knowledge and, and the stories and the identities that is very much about identity um, and the ancestors I mean we have um, I suppose we should talk about actually how the dead were treated in these societies now the dead you know nowadays we have sort of separate sort of cemeteries you know when someone dies they're taken to the cemetery they're buried or they're cremated uh, their urn is placed um, but in the Neolithic things were a lot different what generally happened and what we see lots of evidence for is that when you know grandma grandpa great grandma great grandpa died then their body was taken actually not away from the house but you actually went into you they stayed in the house the people went into their cellars or the ground floor they actually opened their floors and they actually put the grave underneath where they lived so the dead were always with the living in that respect they were treated as you know they were still there the ancestor was so important and some individuals were then um uh the, the the skulls were removed so they went back to the graves at some point and they removed the skull now the skull as i said is a very important part of you know it's the, you know, where the brain sits it's where the you know probably you know that was why it was important they, they knew that without the head you know you couldn't think you couldn't you know it was it was where the, the for the past, where they thought the soul was also and they they took the head the skull and we have actually evidence of these uh skulls being worked i.e um cleaned because i don't think they waited until um it, it's a bit you know grisly now but, you know, but they didn't actually wait until the, the 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 body had decomposed so when they actually removed the head there was still hair and skin attached which they then scraped off with a flint and so you have scratch marks on these skulls and then they probably decorated them, or they may have uh, uh, put a hole in them and actually displayed them and hung them up. Um, displaying, I mean, I think in ethnographic, uh, there are still cultures, uh, still communities around the world um, where there is evidence, recent, more recent evidence of, of, you know, bodies or skulls being taken from the ancestors and brought out on particular occasions during the year to celebrate them. Um, and I think this is probably part of what was happening at Gobekli Tepe as well. So, yeah, the dead were kept with the living, generally speaking, and some individuals, their, their skulls were taken, um, they were cleaned, decorated, displayed, and celebrated in a way. That's really interesting. That was really interesting. And uh, just to get to the actual site now and for everybody listening I guess by now people would have figured out that we're talking about a particular site called Gobekli Tepe 
uh, that's in southern uh, uh, Turkey. So before I get there, I've something that just came to my mind when we say Gobekli Tepe, I've also heard about this zero point in time. And I don't know whether you can call it zero point in time because like you said, there was there were structures other way. So is the zero point in time something that we should take seriously or is it just a... No, the zero point in time is actually sort of a logo um, used by the, um, the authorities here in Turkey to uh, sort of promote the site. Um, obviously, uh, when you're promoting a site for tourism, you need sort of catchy sort of, you know, logos and catchphrases to attract the people. And uh, here at Gobekli Tepe, we have uh, the world's first temples and the zero point in time. Now, these should not be taken at face value. This is just really a part of the advertising campaign to attract people to the site. Mm. Um, from an archaeological from an archaeologist, archaeologist point of view, um, they're pretty... I mean, I don't like to say, but they're pretty nonsensical um, because of yeah. course it, it can't be the zero point in time because before there was obviously the Paleolithic and we had people and we had culture and we had material uh, culture and we had people, you know, we have so much archaeological evidence from, from this period, you know, um, from the Paleolithic. Um, and the world's first temples, I mean, as I say, I'm not too happy with the term temple anyway, because I see these buildings being used for many different purposes. And temple is really sort of, a, again, us sort of, um, uh, projecting our current uh, sort of uh, understanding of religion, organized religion onto these buildings, which actually have nothing to do with those buildings that we know of today, you know, like mosques or you know, temples, modern temples or churches or cathedrals. I mean, this is our modern conception. Um, so I really think, although the buildings at Gebeti Tepe would have had a ritual component, it's obvious, um, but I think they they played more of a role than that. They had more roles to play, uh, and very mainly or predominantly in this social aspect, in this transitional, in this mechanism to cope and to promote identity um, and to cope with these challenges of, of neolithization. True, and I think if you if you go down that direction of of zero point in time, there's then you have to deal with uh, Zeptepi, which is the yeah. Egyptian version of zero point in time. So. <laughs> Then it, yeah, it just I mean, I, I, then I think yeah. every every community has their own zero point. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> right now, uh, at the site when you when you talk about and amazing that I'm talking to you as you've just walked back from that site. That's the thought is amazing. So, are there three layers? If I can understand it right, you call mm. it the oldest layer is layer three, and then mm. that is probably the uh, from the tenth uh, millennium BC, and then you come down to the second. So. How would you explain this easily to us as far as these layers are concerned? Well, um, this, uh, this, uh, these layers, these three layers, these layers were introduced or were um, sort of proposed um, by Klaus Schmidt. Um, but in the past a few years, we've realized that these layers don't actually work. So we're not using these layers one, two, three anymore. Um, I mean... We're looking at the chronology now and stratigraphy. I mean, stratigraphy is like the uh, the, the sequence of different layers. Um, so, you know, at the bottom, usually you have the oldest layer. And at the top, of course, the youngest layer. That's the latest. Um, now, we've realized um, that we can't work with the one, two, three, because it doesn't give us the resolution that we need. Um, in fact, we could probably identify dozens of layers if we wanted to. Uh, but what this one, two, three layer uh, model really helps us to understand is the general chronology of the site. So the bottom layer was always layer three. Um, and we know, of course, that the earliest occupation at Gobekli Tepe actually does date to this PPNA. It's called PPNA, which is pre-pottery Neolithic A. Um, now, this is used uh, to really sort of uh, give a label to this earliest part of the transition to Neolithic from the Paleolithic. Um, it was a time when, of course, as the name says, there was no pottery. Pottery comes in much later, about 7000 BC. So we have pre-pottery Neolithic first, which is divided into A and B. Um, and then comes the, the late Neolithic or the pottery Neolithic around 7000. So the earliest occupation at Gobekli Tepe actually starts around, like you said, the mid 10th millennium BC, which is about 9500 uh, BC. Now, this PPNA then lasts until about 8,700 BC um, when the PPNB starts. And then uh, from 8,700 to about 8,000 BC, 
we have the PPNB, and then the site is gradually abandoned. So we're looking about, as I say, 1,500 years. Now, there are some characteristics for distinguishing uh, PPNA from PPNB. Um, you know, there are differences in the in the types of arrowheads that they produced. Uh, in, 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 but also, I think one of the main differences would be in the architecture. And, um, you know, when I mention this, a lot of uh, people that aren't actually archaeologists are always surprised because it's, it's very interesting because uh, at the transition from PPNA to PPNB, so around 8,700, 8,800 BC, uh, we have this um, development in the architecture where before people were building round or oval shaped houses, but from around 8,700, from the PPNB, beginning of the PPNB, they started to construct buildings more rectangular in shape. So they actually discover the corner, in fact. They start building corners to their houses. Um, now, there are various reasons why this could have happened. But I think mainly if you're working with, with a sort of squares and rectangles, then you can put more buildings in one space without having sort of lost space in between. And that's what we see at Quebec Tepe. A lot of these rectangular buildings are sort of wall to wall connected to one another. So there weren't actually sort of uh, streets between the houses. In fact, people were work walking over the roofs, over the roofs of the buildings. They're actually entering the building through, buildings through the roof. Um, so um, this is quite characteristic of the Neolithic here in Turkey anyway. Um, also in later, uh, you know, in later Neolithic times. Uh, Chattel Huyuk, for example, in, over in central Anatol central Turkey. So it started here roughly. And, and um, yeah, so this is more or less the chronology of the site. So the site starts around 9,500 BC with the PPNA. Um, and then uh, in the PPNB, about 8,700, we have this transition to rectangular architecture. And it's about this time, early PPNB, uh, middle PPNB, which is about 8,700 to 8,200 BP uh, BC. This is when people start uh, domesticating. This is where we have first evidence for domesticated animals, for example, and plants. Although, as I say, at Gebekli Tepe, we still have no evidence for these domesticates yet. Um, but there are other sites which are more or less the same age, which do have sort of sporadic evidence or first evidence for these domesticated species. Um, so this whole, like I was saying previously, this transition from hunting and gathering to uh, farming was not very, was not a linear sort of transition. It was very patchy as well. Some sites did it, other sites didn't. Um, or some sites were experimenting, other sites weren't. I don't know. And, and uh, it's very patchy, uh, this whole, whole thing, um, and not linear. Um, and of course, we have to ask ourselves, was this down to choice? Were people saying, okay, we don't want to do that? I mean, if you're a conservative sort of group and you're, you're happy with your, with your um, very much sort of hunter-gatherer life ways and you don't want this sort of new sort of modern technology coming in, then you're going to say, no, I don't want it. And that could be an actual choice of those communities to say no. Um, so this is a very important area that we're actually looking at at the moment. Um, you know, why don't we have these domesticated species or these early domesticated species at Gebekli Tepe? Why are they not there when they're at other sites at the same time? And this is why we're starting to think now that Gebekli Tepe, instead of being sort of like this new sort of amazing sort of, you know, the smoking gun of neolithization, uh, in fact, it may be the, 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 the pinnacle of uh, hunter-gatherers trying to preserve uh, their old traditions. So there are many exciting areas that we can look at, but this is one sort of uh, uh, sort of path we're following at the moment to, to, to really sort of interpret or to try to understand why this transition was so um, uh, so uh, uh, heterogeneous and, and uh, it didn't happen everywhere at the same time. No, that's very uh, very interesting. And and if I look at the main excavation area, or oh, I think it's like you said, it's the PPNA, which is the oldest, probably one of the oldest photographs I'm, uh, I was looking at. And earlier you mentioned that uh, there were two of these T figures centrally located, and then there was a group of probably uh, individuals around them. Interestingly, I don't know, but maybe something that just struck me. The two people in the center seem to be facing each other, but everybody around doesn't face the two people in the center. They're facing each other as though they move. They are moving in that in a circular direction. It's not quite right. I think the the narrow sides of the pillars are where the the, the faces would have been. I mean, they didn't actually depict faces on these T pillars. They didn't need to, um, because of course a lot of the pillars have these narratives on them, and they're probably part of those narratives. But what actually the pillars are doing 
the ones in the circle in the walls are actually looking inwards and the two central pillars are looking uh, down towards the south. Um, so they're not actually looking at one another. They're actually looking um, uh, at what the pillars in the, in, the, in the walls are looking to the centre, to where these two central pillars are. And the two central pillars or two central beings or humans are looking actually towards the south um, and not facing one another. Probably when I've seen a photograph of on one of the side pillars, you can see a hand or you can see a carving of, right. of, of a human hand, right? Yeah, that's right. And the, the, the actual hands themselves are resting on the stomach, which is actually on the front narrow side of the pillar. Um, and uh, they're actually resting just above a belt and you can see a belt buckle. And below that, you can see a, a loincloth made of fox fur. Um, so that's definitely the front, the narrow front of these, uh, of these uh, figures. Okay. And what about the lion pillar building, which was probably from layer two? I guess that looks much more smaller or le I mean, from, mm. from, from pictures compared to the mm. earlier one, right? It's not necessarily smaller. It's obviously rectangular now. Um, and there are still T pillars in this building. Um, we shouldn't forget that these T pillars, I mean, what I think we're seeing here, um, in the course of the Neolithic, uh, we lose these big monumental buildings. If you look at late Neolithic sites from about 7000 BC, after Gobekli Tepe, they don't have these big monumental structures anymore. And a lot of the ritual and the, and it's, call it, it's called it religion, um, practices were taking place within the actual homes. Um, so I think what we're seeing here is possibly this this sort of the beginning of this transition, the beginning of this sort of removal of these or the the, the new fashion, as it were, of of the of the ritual and the and the religion going from the special buildings, from the monumental buildings, going into the actual domestic sphere, into the homes themselves. And now these tea pillars in in the lion pillar building, they weren't just um, you know important possibly for, for ritual reasons, but they were actually important for holding up the roof because, of course, they're actually roof supports as well. These T-pillar buildings and also the earlier structures, they were never sort of like Stonehenge and open to the sky. These were actually buildings which had a roof on top, okay? The, and and uh, it applies to all the buildings at Quebec Tepe. We think they all had roofs. Um, and uh, with the Lion Pillar building, we called the Lion Pillar building. This was a name given to it by given to it by Klaus Schmidt, but we now realize that these lions are actually leopards. So actually the correct name would be a leopard pillar building, but I think the lion pillar building is stuck to this uh, structure. Um, this would have been also uh, had a, another sort of floor on top, another um, uh, uh, probably living area. Uh, and then the roof where people would have, would have spent time as well. So what we're actually seeing here are with regard to the rectangular buildings like the the lion pillar building or the leopard pillar building uh these are actually sort of the basements or the ground floors and there would have been another story on top of of, of what we see today what's preserved today well the preservation is very good right now i think that's a very very interesting clarification and thank you for that because it now changes a lot in my mind as well i'm sure people listening because i've not really heard or read too much about these t pillars actually being pillars to hold up a roof Probably mm. that's the first time I've heard it because we, when we look at these images, we are trying to make sense of it and uh, and look at it in isolation as a T pillar. But now that you've clarified that these actually held roofs, so yeah, it it. Thank you for that because that's a detail I don't think I've heard before. No, I mean th these these were definitely um, multifunctional, as it were. I mean, not only with the depictions and the the, the symbolic significance, but I think uh, they fulfilled this architectural sort of function as well. Um, and, uh, you know, what we see today at the site, I mean, if you look at the excavation photos, this is just the remains of, of what we have. I mean, you, you've got to, you know, remember that all the buildings, even the monumental buildings with the big T-pillars were all roofed over, that they would have been probably plastered. They would have had a, a white plaster. They would have been using colour as well, you know, red colour. We have lots of, of uh, remains or bits and pieces of pigment ochre, which has been found at the site. So they were using pigment. Um, they would have been probably actually also dressing the tea pillars. So, you know, they wouldn't have been this sort of plain sort of stony color. Although when limestone is freshly cut, it is a lot brighter. Um, but they would have been coloring probably the pillars as well. They probably would have even have also been um, sort of dressing them in furs, for example. Um, you know, these would have been, they probably had the skulls hanging from them. They're little, little holes in the pillars as well, where you can attach things to with cord and string. So um, these would have been highly uh, flamboyant and, and very bright sort of uh, buildings, inside at least, um, but also outside possibly. 
Um, and oh, then, of right. course, if they are roofed over, there's a question of, you know, how could you see inside? And I think this was probably part of the, the whole experience of going into one of these buildings. If you go into a dark building um, uh, that's obviously roofed over and you go in, you need light. And they would have had probably torches going on, you know, flames and, and uh, lamps and various things. Um, uh, and of course, the the flickering of the flame would have brought these images to life in a way. And if you sat there in the evening and if you were were uh, listening to these narratives and possibly even, you know, partaking in, in I don't know, some, some uh, uh, mushrooms or whatever, but that were using to perhaps uh, sort of bring about some sort of trance effect or, you know, a bit trippy, that sort of thing. This would have been part of that experience. So I think they were probably using sort of natural drugs and various things to enhance that effect. But as I say, the, the, the flickering of the lights and, and the flames and various things, that would have brought the images very much to life. True. And uh, yep, while you were talking and when you were just saying that, there were so many images running through my mind and the the Eusselinian mysteries come to mind immediately from Greece, but that's probably not for this discussion and what was happening there. Another interesting one I just wanted to check with you is if any of us look at the pictures or visit Turkey today and look at the environment around, it's totally barren. But there's an eastern central pillar. I think it's an enclosure D, if I'm not mistaken. And something that struck my eyes is, uh, were, were they ducks? Are that, uh, And that was very interesting. So mm. are we saying that ad, that helps us to actually understand that the type of animals or birds yeah. that were available in that area? Wow. Well, of course. I mean, we don't just have the depictions on the, on the stones, but we also, of course, have the faunal evidence of so all of the bones that are recovered. When we excavate these buildings, what we actually excavate is not just earth, but a mixture of earth, rubble um, from the buildings themselves, um, but lots of, of uh, flint tools. I've mentioned flint artifacts and bone, lots and lots of animal bone. And of course, this is coming from the, the middens, from the, the rubbish pits, really, that have uh, slipped into the buildings at some point, have been or rubbish that have been, has been thrown into the buildings once they are abandoned, that sort of thing. And of course, we get, it's this sort of rubbish, when you're looking at the rubbish, that you know about you know, the people, you learn about, you know, if you went to your bin, perhaps, and, and turned your bin out and had to look what you've been eating and various things, you could tell a lot about you uh, by looking at your rubbish. And that's what, us, what we archaeologists actually do. Apart from looking at the architecture, what we're really interested in is the prehistoric people's rubbish. What were they discarding? What were they using? Uh, what was being burnt? Um, you know, what sort of combinations uh, uh, you know, do we find together? And this helps us to date as well, like I was saying, different types of tool and different uh, uh, um, forms of, of arrowhead, that sort of thing can tell us a lot about the dating. Um, so the rubbish is very important. It's a bit like Coke cans. You know, Coke cans have changed over the, over time as well, or Coke bottles. You can do a typology of Coke bottles from the 19, you know, 40s, 50s up to the present, and you see a typology of how the bottles change. And that's how we do it with the stone tools. We can see how these stone tools change over time, and that helps us to date, date certain deposits where they occur. Um, so the rubbish is very important for us. And from this rubbish, we have lots of animal bones. And the animal bones are telling us, of course, what the people were eating. Um, and we know that the environment was a lot different then because, of course, the most important animal that the people were eating uh, at the time for meat um, was uh, the gazelle. And we have no, you know, no gazelle herds roaming around the landscape here uh, now, although there are a few uh, sort of areas uh, not far from Ufa, where I am, uh, where they have some some uh, gazelle now, but um, the big gazelle herds, they're no longer here. They would have roamed the landscape. And we have even evidence, colleagues of mine have, have found evidence for what we call uh, desert kites or traps, animal traps, where they would have actually probably herded these, these gazelle herds in and then would have actually been waiting and uh, it would have been like a, a dead end for the animals and they would have been sort of shot at and, and killed in, in large numbers. So gazelle was very important, but other animals such as um, wild pig, so wild boar, would have been uh, hunted. Uh, we have bones of those as well, but also depictions of them. Um, we have the aurochs, so the wild sort of uh, cattle um, that was here. Um, so it's telling us really that these animals, uh, the environments they were living in, you know, we're probably looking at a sort of a uh, sort of a steppe vegetation, but also with uh, wet areas because we have evidence for birds as well, um, uh, different types of birds, not just your your uh, vultures, um, but also sort of uh, water birds as well. 
and uh, uh, what else do we have? You know, we have uh, also, of course, uh, a lot of depictions of, of snakes and, and scorpions and various things, and we still have them here today. So, uh, yeah, that's what's what we're dealing with. We know what the people were hunting. We know what they were eating. We know which animals were important in their narratives, perhaps for ritual purposes. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting looking at people's rubbish. <laughs> No, very, very, very interesting. And like you, I think interestingly, you mentioned about the waste as an archaeologist that you look for and you find signs. It's, I was just talking to an astrobiologist, interestingly, and he mentioned the same thing about search for extraterrestrial life or planets, where they are looking for biosignatures. So it's, it's the same mm. theory. They're looking for signatures of waste. And also when you talk about these particular uh, time period, do we also know anything else about their maybe fashion, and I don't literally mean fashion, but dressing, I know there was fur, but anything else that tells us about socially, what were they doing? Because uh, I'm not sure, like you said, whether this area was, was it a pilgrimage site where people came and went, or was it settled down and what was yeah. it exactly? Um, yeah, it was definitely a settlement. Um, and this was unknown, um, actually, until Klaus Schmidt passed away. Um, up until about 2014, he was always saying the site was purely a ritual site. People were coming here on pilgrimages from around the landscape. Different groups were coming here. He was saying different groups could have been using different special buildings. Um, and, and this was, was the whole hypothesis at the time. Now, you may have seen more recent photographs from the site. We now have big uh, protective shelters over Gebekli Tepe, over different parts of the site to protect uh, the site, but also to allow visitors to walk around a lot easier and to see uh, the archaeology. And when we're actually um, preparing these, uh, the, the construction of these shelters, we had you know, these these new shelters had to be sort of anchored into the rock and foundations so they don't blow away. And of course, before they could drill into the rock, we had to remove all the archaeology down right through the mound, right to the bottom, to the bedrock, uh, so that they could drill. And these so-called deep soundings or deep pits that we excavated. For the first time, they gave us some very interesting insights into the lower levels of the mound, so the older levels, but also in areas that were previously unexcavated. Um, and there we have found very good evidence for domestic occupation from the very beginning. So we now know that people were actually living at the site for the entire period. Now, we don't know whether they were permanently here, sedentary, or whether perhaps in the early years, decades, centuries, they may have been coming several times throughout the year. Um, to the site, but at some point the site did become a permanent settlement. Probably, you know, towards the end of the 10th millennium, 9,000 or so. I think by then it would have been definitely a permanent settlement when these big monumental buildings were being constructed. Um, and we know that because now we have, and what Klaus Schmidt didn't have before, we have smaller buildings um, with between them um, what we call activity zones or activity areas where we have a, a central hearth so like a fireplace and around the fireplace evidence for people sitting actually chipping stones making beads so making stone beads and be beads from bird bone um, and um, also high concentrations of bone tools which have been used for actually these domestic purposes uh, for making your beads or for sewing or making clothing um so this this would have been um this we now know that you know, this is a settlement so although people may have been coming to the site to see these monumental buildings on sort of a pilgrimage if you want to call it that without sort of you know projecting our current understanding or our current concepts concepts onto the prehistoric past um I think people were coming to the site to see these buildings, to use these buildings, be part of the process, to be part of this, uh, what was going on there. Um, but at the same time, it was a settlement. People were living there. Um, so things have changed in the past five or six years since we've had this new evidence. Right. And when we think of early writing or hieroglyphs, so we, we talk about Sumeria and probably uh, 4000 BC. Mm. Is there any reason for us to uh, think about early forms of or any signs of writing that come up here? No, I have I have no evidence of that. I mean, I don't. I, I, of course, you know, I've spent a lot of the time, a lot of time at the site now, and also looking at the the material from the site. I personally don't see any evidence for for any form of early writing. Um, you know, these are, are, are some. You know, there are symbols. Uh, obviously, we don't know what they mean, um, but I, I I I doubt that they they were were 
were a form of writing in a way. Um, uh, these these symbols, um, we have a lot of H, also called I symbols, which appear on on some of the uh, the T pillars. Um, but of course, that's sort of basing it on 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 characters from our modern alphabet. Um, but it doesn't mean that it was writing. I think there are right. more symbols for certain things um, that we don't understand anymore. That we have obviously, you know, it's a guessing game as such, and right. it's uh, the combinations of, of different symbols of different animal depictions that we have to look at in a way that we can perhaps reconstruct. Um, I don't know the, the the development of the art uh, from earlier periods to later periods, or um, but I think to get really behind the stories that were being told, I think it's very very difficult. I think everyone has to use their own imagination in that respect. Although of course we have to make educated guesses, you know. Yeah, yeah, and okay. Then using my imagination, I want to ask, and you can correct me, but this one. But is there any carving where any of these figures are holding a pouch or a bag? Because that also seems to be getting a little bit of attention in the alternate universe. <laughs> the the, the so-called handbags, I know. Um, we have a pillar in Building D, Pillar 43, and there is a, a, a depiction of three like handbags. Now, um, of course, if you look on the internet and you uh, Google handbags and uh, prehistory or whatever, and go back to Tepe, then you get all of these comparisons with uh, sites in South America and uh, go back to Tepe and, and other sites. It's, um, uh, it's not to take, be taken seriously. Um, these so-called handbag depictions at Gebekli Tepe, I, I think they're not handbags that we can see there. I think we're actually looking at the buildings themselves with the roofs on the top. They are depictions of the special buildings, nothing more. They're not handbags. They just right. look like handbags because we're projecting, yeah. of course, <laughs> our our symbol or what we imagine is a handbag onto the shape that we see on the pillar. But this is not the case. I think we're actually looking at depictions of the of the of the special buildings with a sort of a um, like a dome shaped roof. Right, but you do know there's an entire following and literature on the handbag stories, but we'll leave no. that for now. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Yeah, they haven't yeah. invited me to their symposium yet. I'll, I'll go if they ask me. <laughs> great, great. Now, interestingly, also, the latest pictures that we've seen uh, for people listening, uh, I'm sure a lot of people after listening to this are going to definitely want to get there and uh, visit the site or visit the place. I've also seen pictures of tourists actually watching uh, all of you in action. Now, I find that one of the most interesting things because... There's nothing better than seeing experts actually excavating. And is that part of the tour? So if somebody comes there, will we be able to actually meet you guys, your colleagues, mm -hmm. and see how work is actually being done? Because I think that's the most well, interesting you, part yeah. about it. Yeah, it depends when you come. Um, as I say, we're here at the moment. I arrived last weekend. So um, you know, we're here now. Um, so we arrived sort of first week of May, and we're going to stay until the end of June. And then, uh, because it gets so hot, I mean, obviously it's not as hot as in India, um, but at the moment, but uh, things do get a bit hot here in in July, August. So we tend to sort of leave then uh, for a couple of months and come back in the autumn. So we have two excavation seasons, two fieldwork seasons in the spring, May, June, and in the autumn, September, October time. So if you actually come to the site during those periods, you may well you know, meet us and, and see us in action because, of course, a lot of the trenches we are still working in are located in the areas that are still that are visible on on, on the sort of the, the walkway that the tourists take or the visitors take around the site. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we speak to a lot of tourists uh, when they come. Of course, they all want to speak to us. Which, of course, when you're there for eight hours a day and you get eight hours of people asking you what you're doing, it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, tiring sometimes. We try to speak to as many and people as we can. Oh, yes, that as well, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have people ask for selfies, although with us, but then there are other tourists that would prefer us not to be in the picture and kindly ask us to move <laughs> so they can take a picture, whereas I usually say, no, we're not moving, we're working here. <laughs> right. Now... Obviously, it's very important to popularize this story uh, through everything that's happening around us. We, uh, and I mean, and I hope that there are more people that get into this, study this, uh, become a, become an archaeologist like you. But I also want to understand from you on the on the, on a lighter side. Now, we have something on Netflix called The Gift, and <laughs> that's quite a popular that's quite a popular story where there obviously that's fiction, and I'm going to say that's fiction here. Yeah, so. Uh, there's a symbol that's found and the story is very interesting and I was wondering whether any of those characters are based on you. 
<laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Perhaps on Klaus Schmidt. Uh, no, I think, uh, I mean, the gift when it was recorded, I think it was a couple of years back. I mean, I, I did, I didn't actually see the actors at the site. Um, of course, a lot of it was a lot of it was done in the studios anyway. And I think the other recording at the site was done when we weren't here, so not in the excavation seasons. Um, so uh, I actually watched it on Netflix as well, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had a good laugh. Um, but the, 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 the thing is, we did have then visitors come to the site afterwards asking for particular sort of parts of the site which had been shown in the in the uh, ser series, but which oh, don't actually okay. exist. So there were people asking, you know, are the caves there with the T pillars in? I said, well, no, we don't have those. Um, you know, and uh, no, I don't think any of the characters are based on, on anyone here at the moment. Um, but uh, you never know. <laughs> um, right. I think it's, you know, this sort of thing is, is certainly important. It does bring attention to the site. Um, but my concern is just that when people do watch these things, uh, they do tend to take it, or they perhaps realise it's fiction, but they don't know where the fiction ends and the reality starts. And I think that's something, um, you know, uh, that we can only sort of, through, you know, through me talking to, to or doing interviews and talking to people, or by publishing, uh, you know, this is something we need to get across. Um, you know, there's a lot of strange opinions about what archaeology is. Um, everyone has an opinion. Everyone thinks he or she is an archaeologist. I mean, it's it's true. I mean, everyone is, has a right and everyone is entitled to have their own opinion. Um, but at the same time, we do have the, the evidence from the excavations and that's what we're working with. So any, you know, our interpretations are based on that evidence. Um, and it's sometimes sad when um, our evidence and, and our interpretation um, is not taken um, seriously and people go to to uh, authors um, which are writing obviously more than we are able to write at a greater speed um, talking about I don't know aliens and various other things and they tend to believe that because it's a bit a better story um, that's the thing our story is the story based on our finds on, on what we excavate whereas other people their stories um, that they publish uh, is based on their imagination and unfortunately their story is also the more interesting story and gets more attention and people tend to believe it more that's the problem that we have at the moment also there's been one a clarification if you could give us and i thought that we could get that from you when the site was uh, when people left the site they seemed to be deliberately buried and in a hurry over a short period of time because there was some connection to solar flares or what was happening on the surface of the oh, Earth. No. Now, is no, there any truth I, I, to this, or is no. this the same alien story? No, I, I don't think uh, there was any sort of, sort of I don't know, solar stellar event which led to the abandonment of, of Gobekli Tepe. Of course, there was climate change, uh, um, you know, but that the major climate change happened just before Gobekli Tepe, sort of the transition from the so-called Jungle Dryas period, when it was a cooler and drier environment, to the, the wetter and warmer conditions of the early Holocene when the, when the PPNA starts. Um, and of course, the, the, our current climate, um, or well, I say current, our modern climate, sort of the last 10,000 years, has never been sort of steady. There's always been fluctuation now with different sort of events, little ice ages and various things taking place. And of course, now the, the modern climate change uh, that we've uh, caused. Um, uh, uh, but there's no climate event or there's no uh, sort of natural event uh, that I could actually sort of attach or, or link to the abandonment of Gobekli Tepe. Um, the, the bit about the burial of the buildings, now this is interesting because a lot of uh, colleagues, archaeologist colleagues from other sites from this period, and the Neolithic in general, are finding evidence that buildings were sort of ritually destroyed, buried, burnt, um, at some point at the end of their sort of uh, use. Now, that was always claimed here for Gobekli Tepe as well. And I don't want to say that this is wrong. Um, this is also the, the hypothesis by Klaus Schmidt. But what we're finding now is that um, possibly some of this sort of fill of in, in the special buildings that led to the burial of these buildings actually stems from uh, other buildings because these special buildings are a bit lower down. They're in sort of a dip um, and the mound sort of rises on three sides around them, a bit like sort of an amphitheater. And uh, at some point, the buildings on the on the on the slopes um, they probably collapsed 
into the buildings, the special buildings located below and actually filled them up in this way. Because of course, what we find today are only the cellars of these buildings and the basements. Uh, and I think a lot of the superstructures of these buildings that were on the mound, they actually slipped down during a sort of a, a landslide, a landslip, a slope slide. Um, and this may have been caused by, you know, uh, torrential rain, the, you know, the, the slope getting heavier and, and a lot of pressure. Uh, it may have been perhaps even an earthquake uh, or two of different events of that type, which could have led to the buildings becoming buried in this way. So although uh, we don't want to totally rule out that buildings were being ritually buried at that time because they were at other sites. There are also indications that it was some sort of event that happened at Gobekli Tepe, be it an earthquake or, like I said, heavy rainfall, leading to this slip of the slopes where these rectangular buildings were, were constructed, were, were actually standing, and it led to them sort of slipping down and filling up the monumental buildings, which then actually preserved them for us until today. Perfect. And this particular site as uh, on scale uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong here i think uh, the last i read was the whole site is about 22 acres if if i'm right and how much mm. of what you think is part of this site has actually been excavated in in form of like so much percent and so much more to be discovered oh it's yeah i mean i think less than 10 percent has been actually excavated it's a very big mound um and uh, you know there are so many areas still to look at um, I mentioned that the special buildings uh, in the main excavation area are in a sort of a dip um, and on three sides you have the slope going up where there are other buildings but we also have two other dips in the or, or sort of holes in the in the mound where further um, special buildings can be expected and we know in the northwest there is one because we've excavated there Klaus Schmidt started excavations there in 2009 so we have building H in the northwest but there's also another sort of dip to the northeast uh, of the mound, uh, where further monumental buildings uh, probably stood. I mean, we have some geo radar that was done, and there certainly looks like there's some sort of signal there, and that we have further buildings there too. Um, so really a fraction of the site has been excavated. There's so much more to find. Um, we know roughly what to expect, but at the same time, um, there's always more surprises in store. And uh, one thing I, I, I just wanted to note now is that Gobekli Tepe is not the only T-pillar site, obviously. We now know of a dozen other sites of this type in the region of Shan here in southeastern Turkey, so within a radius of, say, 100 or so kilometers. Um, and excavations are actually now taking place at these sites. They actually started last year, uh, actually in 2019, at a site called Karahan Tepe, which is about 50 kilometers away or 40 kilometers away as a crow flies from Gebekli Tepe. Uh, but there are several other sites also with T pillar, um, uh, with uh, T pillar remains and uh, of a PPN date, PPN A, PPN B. Um, in the region and excavation started there last year and it's part of a big new project, a Neolithic research project down here in southeastern Turkey in Şanlıurfa province in the city of Şanlıurfa looking at the Neolithic. Um, so we have Karan Tepe, we have Sefer Tepe, we have Sayburç um, and the, the, the list goes on and excavations are now underway at these sites. So we're getting now comparative sort of data to look at from these sites that we can compare with what we found at Gebekli Tepe which means a site we're no longer relying on, on just the material from our site, but we can look at close by sites to see what they're finding as well. And there are some very spectacular finds, at least from Karahan Tepe so far, um, which are now on display at the museum, a uh, very new display. Um, and uh, there are tea pillars and there are uh, big phalli and uh, lots of human depictions. Um, so really, uh, it's well worth a visit uh, if you come to Gebekli Tepe to actually look at the museum and also go to these other sites as well, which I think will be opening very soon to the public as well. Amazing just to hear that it's just 10% of excavation that has been done. And more interestingly, you just said there are 12 more sites that need work to be done. And so any of uh, our students listening who are in this field already, you do know that there are some job <laughs> options coming up very soon. So you're on the right path <laughs> and just head to Turkey. <laughs> That's right. I mean, uh, uh, the, the archaeology, I mean, is, is fantastic. And for anyone specializing in the Neolithic period, I mean, this is a, a very important area. And it's really the non plus ultra. Um, as I say, I'm very lucky to be here, very lucky to work here. And I think my colleagues all think the same. Just before I wind down, I know I've taken a lot of your time. This particular mound, 
is called, or was it called, Port Belly Hill? And I was looking at a picture. Is there just one tree that is still there on that mound? Um, there are a few more trees, but the one you're referring to is the wish tree, which is on one of the highest points of the mound. And this wish tree has been uh, actually, um, even before excavation started, uh, the, the, where the wish tree is, uh, there are also uh, two or three uh, graves, uh, modern, I say modern graves, Islamic graves. Um, now, obviously, we can't excavate there because uh, this part of the site until very recently um, was being used as a place of pilgrimage by local uh, by the local population. And I don't know if you've seen these wish trees that people go to them and they sort of take their wishes and they tie them onto pieces or they write their wish on pieces of fabric and tie right. them to the branches of the tree. Uh, and this was taking place um, in the decades before the excavations took place for I don't know for how long before. Um, so it, it would appear that the site has also, ha also always had this sort of ritual sort of function around it. And then at some point, these uh, uh, modern graves, if they are graves, we don't know, we're not allowed to excavate there, we're actually put there. So it's, it's been a bit of a local sort of uh, place of pilgrimage, as it were. And it's been said that, uh, especially for, for women uh, with a wish for, for, for becoming pregnant, for having children, this would be the place to, to go to make that wish. But of course, now we see the tourists also on this same pilgrimage. You know, they come to see the site, of course. But one of the biggest sort of uh, uh, sort of focus points for the for the tourists when they've when they've seen the archaeology is actually the wish tree. And of course, they go up there, and we have a lot of people actually um, either uh, touching the tree, still trying to tie their wishes to the branches or put them into the wood into the, behind the bark. Um, we have different. Um, uh, groups of, of religious groups coming here as well. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Muslims and Christians. We have Christians also singing psalms and various things as well. Because of course, in the in the media, there's a lot of uh, speak of, of a talk of the site being located in the Garden of Eden. Um, this is not think, something that I would, you know, uh, sort of uh, propagate as an archaeologist. But uh, in in the Bible and uh, authors since then have. Uh, you know, have, have proposed that we're in the Garden of Eden here. Um, so we have a lot of different, we have like the, the, the new age sort of generation and, and uh, esoterics coming as well. Um, but of course, you know, everyone and people meditating. And th this is something that, you know, uh, I'm totally open and happy uh, with. I think the site is, is there for everyone not just for us archaeologists, but also open to anyone with their own beliefs to come here and to actually enjoy the site. And, and that's what it's about. Um, you know, I think it would be wrong, and this is often portrayed, that we are academics are, are really sort of uh, uh, nonchalant and, and uh, we don't listen to other people's opinion. That's not the case. Um, you know, we, we like to have these people coming here. And we like to see them enjoying the site and actually, you know, taking part um, and, and carrying on this tradition, as it were, from which goes right back to, to the Neolithic, you know, 12,000 years ago. Mm, that's beautiful. No, I saw the tree. I, I wasn't sure whether it was the wish tree, and I wanted to hear it from you and confirm, but that that's really beautiful. And Lee, before we let you go, uh, there are students listening to us. There are people who want to get into archaeology. There are kids who are thinking about their careers who are probably immediately now thinking of taking the next next flight to Turkey. So <laughs> if you had to speak to these students, what, what, what would your advice be to them and, and what would you like to tell them? I would say do it. <laughs> um, of course, in, in the modern day and age, especially you know, if you have parents that are saying, oh, we've got to find a good job. Uh, one that pays well. I mean, archaeology is not one of those jobs. You know, this is not the private sector where you're going to earn lots and lots of money. That's that's not going to happen. But for anyone interested in this sort of thing that has a passion for this sort of thing, I think you know, enjoying that passion and being able to do this work is so much more rewarding. I mean, we all need a bit of money to survive. That's obvious. But you know, the experience that you have, the people you meet. Um, I think the job as an archaeologist is absolutely fantastic and I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, uh, it's Like I said, it's, it's meeting these people, it's going to, you travel a great deal. Of course, it depends on your specialization, um, but you've got to be open to travel. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think people know if they're interested in this career from a very early age. And even if they go via a sort of a detour like I did with modern languages and various things, I think you always end up where you know where you want to be, or where you, you know, not always, but um, uh, this has been my case. I've been very fortunate. Um, 
regarding studies, I mean, um, I think everyone, of course, there are very different areas you can specialize in archaeology, of course, you know, you can, you can do Roman archaeology, classical archaeology, you can do Neolithic, you can do Bronze Age, Copper Age, Iron Age, all of these different uh, periods. And I think that's something you find out when you start studying yourself and start looking more at books. Um, but of course, for me, it was always Neolithic because Neolithic was this period of, of great change, great transition, this hunter-gatherer sort of uh, to, to, to farmer. Um, no matter where it happens, be it in Africa or be it here uh, in Europe, uh, it doesn't in Asia, it doesn't really matter. It's this great sort of transformation that happened and how people were affected. I, I mentioned earlier that I was into dinosaurs as a child, but, you know, it wasn't long before I realized that humans are much more interesting than animals and, and dinosaurs. And it's this human thing, it's this social thing that, that really sort of uh, grabs me. And, and just to, to, to realize, you know, when you, when you go to a site, do an excavation, and you bring out, you find something, no matter how small, be it a, an arrowhead or um, later, in later periods, I don't know, a metal brooch, whatever, you were the first person to hold that since that was dropped that many thousand or hundred years ago so it's always a great experience um and teaching as well i mean i i i, I i'm doing courses so I, I will teach courses and uh it's always great to to see the um you know people's reactions when when you talk to them uh doing lectures so it's uh, a very rewarding uh career in my opinion um so as i say if you really want to do it definitely go for it beautiful and should somebody want to follow you or follow your work or know more about you or contribute to this particular project that you're running in Turkey, is there some site or place that you would want to direct them to? Yeah, I mean, there is uh, the website Tepe Telegrams um, as a blog site, although we haven't been updating there for a, a few years now, but the plan is to get that underway again pretty soon. Um, we uh, we ha we're not really uh, that visible on the on the social media at the moment. Although you will find occasional blogs on the uh, German Archaeological Institute uh, uh, Istanbul uh, page, um, and also, I mean, if anyone's interested in some of the latest publications, you can also look at my academia page. I have a, a page on academia where I have some of the latest publications actually downloadable as PDF, um, where you can get a glimpse into what we're doing here, uh, but also other colleagues as well working at the site, you can find them on Academia as well. Um, but if you go to my Academia page, I think you'll, you'll find perhaps a, couple, a year or so back, I did a little paper uh, summarizing the work from the past three or four years, and you can find that there as well, and it's freely available in English. Right, and Lee, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. There's a lot that you've clarified for us and I think it's really important to put this Gobekli Tepe movement out there. I call it a movement because we're learning a lot about so uh, about culture, we're learning about history and and hopefully we have more people that are going to be invested in, in, these, in, in these adventures but thank you from everyone here in India and hope, hope to probably talk to you again whenever you have the time. You're always welcome. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I very much enjoyed it. And of course, if your listeners do have uh, questions about archaeology or about the site, I'll be happy to, to come back and answer them if you, if you would have me. Thank you so much once again. This Hub Hopper original ko sunne ke liye aapka shukriya. Agar aap bhi apna podcast launch karna chahte hain, to Hub Hopper Studio website pe register karein aur ek minute ke andar andar apna khud ka podcast launch karein. Yahi nahi, Studio deta hai aapko puri azadi kahi bhi, kabhi bhi apna podcast launch karne ki sirf teen aasan steps mein. To saath mein apna podcast shuru karne ke liye taiyar. Just hop on. Hub Hopper, simply content.